Well, let's get ready for the Word of God. And today I'm excited to, uh, to share um, this message that is found in the book of Mark. I was going to, uh, I, wanted to, uh, to I wanted this story to be in the book of John because, uh, as you know, Pastor Tim is preaching from book, uh, the book of John in John 15. And I said, oh, man, if only this story would have been also in the book of John, it would have seemed like uh, as if we're like, you know, all synced spiritually, right? The Holy Spirit just speaking to us from the same book and everything. But uh, it is in the three synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. But it's not in John. So this story is found in the first three books of the Bible, I mean, of the New Testament, the, the Gospels. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention most of it from the book of Mark, chapter 5. And, and this, is, um, this is a story within a story, like a sandwich, right? And, and we're going to be looking at the, right at the middle, right? At this story that happens within Another story, and they're all together and, and related because Jesus never does something, you know, just randomly and disconnected. He has a purpose even when he does a miracle within a miracle, okay? So let's see what uh, the Bible says here in the book of Mark 5, uh, verses 21 to 34. It says like this, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake where a large crowd uh, gathered um, around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd has suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She has suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she has spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him, through the crowd, and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately. The, the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed for, of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. Your suffering is over. So we, we see this woman that has a, a terrible uh, condition. She has been afflicted for 12 years. You know, 12 long years with this um, constant bleeding. You know, in other, in other uh, versions of the Bible, or most of us have, have, have heard this, if you have heard this story, you've heard the woman with the issue of blood, right? So uh, that, that's, what, you know, in other versions, how they call it the, the condition, you know, terrible condition of this woman. And this lady right here, this woman, had some issues, right? She had not just one issue, but she had several issues. I think it was one issue that was causing a lot of more issues. Have you ever known a person or someone who, who you say, man, you know, you got issues, right? <laughs> you got issues, right? Uh, or maybe you tell that person, man, you don't have issues. You are an issue, right? <laughs> you are the issue. <laughs> anyway, you know, this lady was, ha had issues, you know. Tell the person next to you, do you have issues? And you say, hey, you got issues? You got issues right here? Because we're going to talk about this, and Jesus uh, is going to, Talk to us about these issues. Um, this lady had, you know, some 
an issue, but also she was dealing with other issues, other problems, other situations. Physically, she had been sick for 12 years. 12 years. Imagine that. 12 long years. Now, it's one thing to uh, deal with a situation, with an issue, for a week. Right? Think about it. Maybe you can even deal with it for a month. I can give you six months, right? Even up to a year, you say, okay, you know, I got this issue, you know, I've, I've dealt with this for a year. But when it becomes year after year after year, the same issue, you kind of get tired of it. You know, it drains you. You know, you even pray, you say, God, I know I'm going to have issues this new year, but at least give me a new one, right? Let me just deal with a different one, right? Imagine 12 years of the same one. It's like, oh man, again, right? This is it's tough. I mean, I can, I can handle something for a few months, maybe a year or two, but 12 years, that's the big issue. Also, she um, had a financial issue, her finances. So the story that says that she has spent everything she had in doctors and treatments and trying to get some, some relief and, and some, something that would help her, something that would alleviate her situation. But nothing had worked. In fact, it says that, that she had spent all that she had in doctors, but nothing worked. So financially, she had some issues. Also, emotionally, her situation, the Bible says that had gone from bad to worse. How many of you can relate to, you know, to, to that? You, you're praying, you're believing, but you see your situation not getting better, maybe not even staying the same, but you see the situation going from bad to worse, and it's like, man, this is not, not getting any better. And for those of you who are maybe um, starting in your Christian walk here in Life Church, maybe you 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 you're feeling like, man, when I was you know when I was not in, in, into God and my faith in Jesus, things were okay. But now that I'm in church and believing in God and trying to walk close to Jesus, things are kind of getting from you know from from bad to worse. What's going on, right? And sometimes it feels like that. Now, remember, this is a situation that not just physically, financially, but also emotionally for her, it was embarrassing. And a lot of us could maybe relate to that because we have an issue, a situation that maybe it could be like, yeah, other people know about it, or maybe you just only you know about it, but it's embarrassing to even talk about that. And this, this woman had this issue, and emotionally it was draining her. It was embarrassing. Relationally and socially, also, that was another issue for her. She was separated from the one she loved. According to Leviticus 15, uh, the, the, the law said that whoever, you know, had a, 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 a bleeding, everything she touched, everything she, you know, she even sat on, everything that was, you know, that was, had any physical contact with her was considered ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Even if she touched someone, that person became ceremonially unclean. They were not allowed in the community because everything that she touched was unclean according to the law. So that was another issue. And then, on top of that, spiritually, she had another issue. She was not allowed to worship with the community. Imagine someone says, all right, you... You're a, a faithful, active, you know, committed member of Life Church. But because of this, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna ask you not to come to worship with us, you know, until, you know, for some time. So, you know, check with us later, right? And you're like, what? Why? It's because you have some issues, right? And you just want to work those issues, and then you come here. Well, this lady was separated from the community, from even going into the temple and worship. And going, and, and going into, you know, with everybody else to worship to, in, in the temple or the synagogue because she was ceremonially unclean. She was not allowed, according to the law in Leviticus 15, to go and worship together because she was ceremonially unclean. Imagine those issues. Maybe some of you can relate to one, two, to some of these issues that this lady was having. 
either physically or financially, emotionally, socially, maybe even spiritually. But I'm here to tell you, as we're going to see in, in the rest of the story, even when you got issues, Jesus is bigger than my issues. He is bigger than all of them. Not just one or two or maybe some of them. He is bigger than all of those issues. How many say yes? Amen. That's right. Yes. <clears throat> so he's bigger than all my issues. Than your issue, my issue, he's bigger than all of them. So I want to focus on, on, on a few verses. Because there's a lot of, you know, in this story. Like, like I said, you know, it's a story within a story. And there's a lot of it because of time. We, we don't have time to, to go into all of those details. But I want to focus on this woman's actions and attitude and, and, and the way she went about uh, trying to reach Jesus. In verse uh, 28 says, For she thought to herself, If I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Now, as I was studying this, this, uh, this story, I realized that a lot of other versions, and going back into the original meaning, it says that this woman was just not saying, you know, she, did, she didn't just say one time, oh, let me just go. I heard about Jesus, and I, I know that he's coming around here close, so let me just go, and if I can just touch the robe, his robe, I will be healed. It didn't say just once. Remember, there was a, a, a crowd, you know, there was a lot of people, a multitude of people pressing in on Jesus. And it was hard for him to, to just move around as they went, you know, their, make, make their way. So this lady was trying to get to Jesus and she thought to herself. And in the original meaning, it says that she kept saying to herself, that she kept saying to herself, that she kept repeating and saying to herself, if I can only touch his robe. And as she make her way to Jesus, she didn't just say, once, okay, if I can only touch his robe. She kept saying it over and over and over again. You know what? Sometimes we don't need another word. We don't need a different word. We don't need to go and say, oh God, give me a, give me a word. God has already given you a word, a promise. So all we need to do is hold on to it and keep believing. And that's what she said. You know what, God? I know that you've told me my family will be saved. So I'm going to keep saying that, not because it's going to be a monotonous repetition, you know, like a mantra and something, you know, magically is going to happen. No, it's because we need to hold on to that word that God has already given you. And don't quit, don't try to change it and say, well, maybe that wasn't it, you know, maybe, well, well I, I get another one. Maybe, maybe this will hit, you know, and will work. No, just keep believing the word, the promise that God has already given to you. Hold on to it. Like this, this, this woman, she kept saying to herself, and as she was jostling and, and, and just making her way through Jesus, through the crowd, she said, if I can only touch his robe, if I can only touch his robe, and sometimes we need to do the same thing. We need to hold on to that word and say, God, my marriage is going to restore. My marriage is going to restore. And as you go through all the issues, you know, that we all go through, you're going to say, yes, Lord, but you said that you are going to restore my marriage. And you keep believing that my finances are going to get better. If I keep being wise and doing the right things, I'm going to get better better it's gonna get better and then you keep holding to that word instead of just okay well let me give me another word well maybe this one will no hold on to it and keep believing and keep believing now another thing that i <clears throat> that i see about this this lady is that as she was trying to reach jesus it says in 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 in, in, in the in the story that she said if i can only touch his robe his garment, right? And like I mentioned in the beginning, this story is in Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. And these other uh, stories in, in Matthew and Luke also let us know a little bit of more details, right, uh, about this story. And in Matthew 9.20, it says, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood, an issue of blood, a constant bleeding, for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. Touched the hem of his garment. And I wanted to focus on this because it, it wasn't that the woman just was, you know, just trying to get to Jesus, but she was a woman with, you know, with, with purpose and she was intentional in everything she, she did as she was trying to get to Jesus. 
And I thought about trying to reach the hem of his garment. This woman had to get low to get to Jesus and touch the hem, the outer cord of his garment. You cannot touch the hem of that robe standing up. Think about it. Can you touch the hem of your jeans, you know? If you don't get low, you have to get low. So this woman had to get low in order to get to Jesus and touch the hem of his robe. And he talks about a humility that she had to that she had to have. She had to have this humility. And instead of coming like, well, I've already spent all my money, so somebody's going somebody's gonna to do something to me because i got to get my money's worth and all of this I spent. So if I come to Jesus, you better do something for me. She came and said, I know, i got all these issues. Physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually, socially, relationally. <clears throat> but I'm not coming to you, Jesus. Standing up on anything I've done, on how good I am, or how poor, or how, look at my situation. I'm coming to you with a humble heart because I have to get low to touch the hem of your robe. And that's the attitude that we need to have when we come and reach Jesus. A humble heart, humility, will open the door to grace and mercy. The Bible says in Psalms 51, 17, the sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O God. God never rejects a humble heart. When you come to him with that humility, He will say, hey, I I don't reject a contrite, broken, repentant, humble heart. Also, God restores those with a humble heart. Isaiah 57, 15, it says, The high and lofty one who lives in eternity, the holy one, says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. And I I underline that. Contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant heart. God restores those with a humble heart. So that's why it, is, it, was, very, it was key for her to come to Jesus and touch the, the hem of the robe. She had to get low. The heart was low. It was humility. On her part. And one more thing, it says that God blesses those with a humble heart. Isaiah 66 it says, My hands have made both heaven and earth, they and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite heart, hearts who tremble at my word. God blesses those with a humble heart. I'm going to be humbled to drink a little bit of this water. God blesses those with... Thank you. Thank you so much. So, she had to get low. Talks about a humility in her heart. And when we come to Jesus, we got to remember, Lord, I'm going to come to you not based on how good I am, how talented I am, how uh, smart I am, if I know much, or I've been a Christian for, you know, for quite a while. Uh Uh-uh, none of that. I'm going to come on the basis of humility, just like Jesus. He was humble, and he humbled himself, that he emptied himself and gave himself for us. So humility opens the door to grace and mercy. Now, there's also another uh, meaning to touching the hem of his garment. There's one more, you know, one, one more thing that I wanted to mention there. Um, 
it, it's the hem or, or the border uh, of the robe had these little things, you know, like uh, tassels. You know, the Bible calls them tassels. And, and we see this uh, that in the Bible, in, 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 the book of, in the book of Numbers. These tassels had a spiritual purpose. Oh my goodness, my voice is sounding kind of, you know, it's kind of going away and away. I want to, I want to try to do my best and, and see if I can, if I can get through this. I, <clears throat> <clears throat> I don't know what happened, but uh, it was there when I started, so I don't know where it went. <laughs> All right. The, the, the hem of the robe of Jesus has some tassels. And it wasn't because he, Jesus was into fashion. You know, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, these are going to look cool. You know, have the, some tassels here and there, you know, and, and it's going to be a fashion statement. He wasn't into fashion. These tassels had a, a, a meaning, a spiritual purpose. We find in the book of Numbers 15, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Throughout the generations to come, you must make tassels for the hems, of your clothing and attach them with a blue cord. When you see the tassels, you will remember and obey all the commands of the Lord instead of following your own desires and defiling yourselves as you are prone to do. The tassels will help you remember that you must obey all my commands and be holy to your God I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that I might be your God. I am the Lord your God. So these tassels had a, had a spiritual purpose, a spiritual meaning. And it, it amazes me that th this lady, this woman, not only had to get low, but she knew, hey, if I can only touch the, the hem of his robe, because I know that in those in that, in, in that robe and in the hem, I know because of the law, you know, it said that it has tassels. And those tassels are not just because, oh, they look cool, because they had a meaning. They had a purpose, a spiritual purpose. It says that she connected her faith with the word because it said, when you see the tassels, you will remember my promises. You will remember my commands. You will remember my word. So she came and she connected her faith. She said, you know, I've heard about Jesus. And I know if I can just touch him and get to him, I will be made well. But also, I'm going to get low in humility and knowing that I'm going to remember God's covenant keeping promises of his word because I see those tassels that represent the word and the promises of God. And she connected that faith with the word of God. And you know what happens when you and I connect our faith with the word of God? Something supernatural can happen. Something supernatural can happen. Miracles can happen. Something that is beyond your human capabilities. Because we connect our faith with the word of God. And this connection of faith and the word of God it gave this woman the confidence and the conviction to push her way through the crowd. And I'm here also to remind you, church, when we connect our faith, not just on our emotion, although that's part of it because we're human, not just like, yeah, I know. Why? Well, I, I, I just know, right? I, I heard it on the radio. I saw it on TV or whatever. No, when you connect that faith and you connect it with the word of God, it says right here, and you connect those two, man, it gives you a confidence. It gives you a conviction that no matter what comes against you, you know, but the word of God says, and I have faith, not in my faith, not in my prayers, not in my own righteousness. I have faith in his word because he is a covenant keeping God. He is a God who keeps his promises. And this lady saw these tassels and remembered, hey, my God says that he keeps his promises. And he says that if I obey him, if I'm faithful to him, he will lift me up. He will heal me. So connect your faith 
with the Word of God, and you will find an incredible confidence and conviction that is going to help you push away through your issues and your situations and even adversities or even the, the, the opposition from people or even the circumstances that tell you otherwise that things are not getting better. You say, but I am believing God because of the faith that I have in Him and the Word that He has given me. Amen. Something happens when we connect those two. Something happened. Now, it amazes me that when we read the law that, you know, whoever had a, an issue like this, and, and, and in fact, the, the, the law said a lot of other issues that, can, that could make a person unclean, anytime something like that happened, or an unclean person or, uh, uh, or thing touched someone, that someone would become undefiled or unclean ceremonially unclean and with the law that's the way it was unclean would touch the clean therefore that person too would become unclean ceremonially unclean or defiled and that was with the law but here in this story it didn't happen like this with Jesus it was this unclean person who touched the clean Son of God. And Jesus didn't become defiled or unclean. You see what happened? Because the law said, hey, if she touches anything, if she would sit on a stool, if she would touch, you know, even utensils in the kitchen, those things would be considered unclean. But here comes this woman Knowing, you know, and she was kind of going, you know, from behind, not wanting to be noticed, not wanting to be singled out. She was just, you know, pushing her way through the crowd that was pressing in on Jesus. And she was making her way to, to him. He, she didn't want to be noticed. She, wanted, she wasn't making a big thing to, 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 to bring attention to herself. She was trying to get to Jesus. And hopefully, you know, once I get, once, once get clean, I'm just going to get out and slip away. That was kind of her intention. But this woman, knowing that she was unclean, and she didn't want anybody to say, hey, this is, a, this is the woman who's, who's, who's spent all her, you know, her savings for 12 years. This is the woman who's unclean. And everybody started just you know, you know, running away from her. You know? Unclean, unclean. And that's what they would do. But this woman was just quietly pushing her way through, Jesus, through the crowd to Jesus. And, and, and she knew she was unclean. And she knew that the law and, and, and what would happen, but somehow the unclean touched the clean. And Jesus remained clean. How could this happen? How could this be? It's because grace is always greater than the law. The law came through Moses, but grace came through Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter what kind of issue do you have. He's not afraid of your issues. I don't want to go to church because once they, re they know what, what's going on in my life. Or if I talk to someone, I don't want to go to counseling or CR and just kind of talk about what, what I'm going on. What's going on in my life. What ha what's happening to me. What I'm facing. The issues that I'm, that I'm dealing with. I don't want to do that because, you know, uh, they're probably going to single me out. They're going to probably, you know, kind of, you know, shun me away. They're going to look at me differently. They're going to look down on me. None of that is going to happen. You know why? Because grace is always bigger and greater greater than any issue that you and I may have. Jesus is bigger than, than our issues. <clears throat> He's bigger. He's greater. The law said, you are unclean. Grace, grace said, you are clean. The law said, you're separated, isolated. Grace says, you belong here. You see how it worked? Jesus is greater than our issues. That's why. That's why, you know, he didn't become unclean. And he's not afraid of all of our issues. Oh, pastor, if I go to church, you know, everybody else had their stuff together. You know, everybody else, you know, their marriages are working great and perfect, you know. 
And everybody else got, has their finances, you know, just right. Everybody else has their families, their children just perfectly behave. Everybody else has their work. Everybody else has nobody. I'm the only one with these issues. I don't want to go to church and, and, and or to this program or to this class. I don't want to go because I might be the only one like that. And I don't want to just bring these issues on the church. No. This church exists to bring healing and restoration in Jesus' name. Why? Because grace is always greater than any issue, than any problem, any situation. Don't be embarrassed. Jesus is not scared of any of our issues. So come. He's bigger than our, our issues. Now, to kind of finish the, the story, like I said, there are a lot of things that we can mention about this story, but I'm just focusing here on this woman and some of the things that, that she did that really impacted me because Jesus is bigger than any issue that you and I you know, could be facing or dealing with. Jesus asked in verse 30 and 31 and even 32, it says, he said, who touched me? Now just imagine, you know, there's a lot of people around Jesus pressing in as they make their way, you know, on the road. And, and, and people are, you know, you got to think about this story. You got to put yourself in the story. This is not just people, you know, just walking, you know, casually, cavalierly, you know, walking like having a, a day in the park, you know, nicely. No, it was a throng of people. It was, it was a crowd. People were just touching and rubbing and pushing against Jesus. It was like Stonebriar in Christmas time. December 23 at 11 at night. How many of you have been there? Or Galerias, you know? It's like, man, where all these people come from? You know, I just wanted to come and get a, a last-minute gift, you know, for Christmas. And, um, it, but it's like everybody there. Everybody rubbing and touching and pushing against Jesus, you know, jostling. It was like, it was bad. It was a lot of people. And then Jesus turns around in the crowd and he asked, who touched me? That's, you know, that's something. Uh, sometimes even funny because, like, oh, come on, Jesus, you know. Even the disciples said, Jesus, you see all these people shoving and pushing and pressing in on you. And you asked who touched you, you know, who touched me? You ask that question, come on, Jesus, you know, it's like, come on, Lord, Jesus, come on, get real, you know, how are we going to know, right? Now, Jesus wasn't asking this question because he didn't know, and it sounds like he, did, he doesn't know. It sounds like Jesus lacked certainty in that situation, and you're like, whoa, whoa, isn't he omnipresent and omnipresent? Uh, omniscient, all-knowing, right? Doesn't he know that? So why is he asking who touched me? Sounds like he doesn't know. So if he doesn't know, and, and, and he lacks certainty, does that diminish his deity? You know, I'm like debating this. You know, that's, those, are, those are real questions that you have. You know, why did he ask who touched me? Doesn't he, didn't he know? Of course he knew. But why did he ask that? Well, several reasons. One, he wants to help us have an understanding and prepare us for the answer that is about to come. Think about it. The reason, one of the reasons why he, Jesus asked some questions is because he wants to create in, a, create in us that understanding. You're like, ah. And then when the answer comes, you're like, oh, now I got it, right? Now I got this. So Jesus was trying to create this, this context, this preparation, this understanding in the woman, in the, in the disciples, and especially this woman. Hey, I'm going to help you create an understanding of the answer that you just received. Number two, another, another reason why he asked this question is because he wanted to rebuke the crowd. A lot of people were pushing and shoving and, and just rubbing against Jesus. But only one person touched Jesus. We can have this place full. Thousands of people 
coming every Sunday, every service. We could have five, eight, ten services, you know, every Sunday and on, on, on Saturdays. But if, if, if that's all it is, it's just a lot of crowd, but people are not touching Jesus. It doesn't matter the crowd or the size of the, of, 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 you know, the crowd here. Only one touched Jesus. Well, so what does it tell you? That it's not about the crowd. It's about who's coming here with a hunger and a desperation and a, and a conviction and a faith that says, you know what? I want to go see Jesus. I want to touch Jesus. I want to have an encounter with Jesus every time I go to church. And yes, we could have this place full, but are you really touching Jesus? Are you really touching Jesus? Because we can have a lot of people and then only, you know, those who came with faith and with that hunger touched them. Jesus. So that was a rebuke to the crowd and, and also, I think, to the, to the disciples. Hey, it's not who... Because they were touching him. Everybody was touching him. But only one touched him. And he knew that because he said, I know someone touched me because I felt power gone out from me. Someone came here today. Not just as a routine, not just because it's Sunday, not just because, oh, that's the thing we do on Sundays at 10. Someone came here saying, I'm going to worship Jesus. And that's the attitude that we want to have as a church. How many of you say, yes, pastor? That's how we want to come. Yes. I want to come and say, Lord, I'm not going to come here out of a routine. Oh, that's what we do. I want to come here because I want to touch Jesus. And number three, this is what I really, I really loved about the story in, in this specific verse. Jesus asked who touched me because he wants us to declare who did it. The woman was there. And she, her, her plans in other versions, in other, in other uh, 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 gospels, it says that she wanted to slip away. Imagine, you know, this is something embarrassing. I want to just go there and get my blessing and leave. And a lot of the times, you know, that's what happened. Lord, thank you. You know, give me a blessing. Give me a miracle. Intervene. Do something for me. And then you're like, oh, thank you. All right, I'm gone. You know, and then you leave or we leave. But that's what she wanted to do. But Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. I got something even bigger for you. He asked, who touched me? And everybody else, you know, is like, turn around. Like, what do you mean? Come on, Jesus. I mean, who touched you? You see the people here? But the woman knew. And then she was frightened about the realization that what had just happened to her, that she was with fear and trembling and came to Jesus and worshipped him and said, it was me. And, I, and she told him everything that she had done. And Jesus asked this question. That's because he didn't know. It's because he wants us to declare the truth. Who did it? And Jesus is asking the same question. Who blessed you? Jesus. Who healed you? Jesus. Who provided for you? Jesus. Who saved you? Jesus. Who lifted you out from that situation? Jesus. Who rescued you when you thought there was no way out? Jesus. Who was the one who helped you? Jesus. Who protected you? Jesus, and sometimes we just want to get the blessing, and then we forget about declaring not just what he's done, but who did it. And in your life, Jesus has already done something, and you, you need to declare who did it. Who did it? Hey, what happened to your marriage? You used to be like this. Well, let me tell you what. Jesus restored my marriage. He was the one. What happened to you? You were always dealing with this situation, this addiction. Let me tell you what. Jesus did it. He did it. He was the one who healed me. So he wants us to declare who did it. Who's the one who has done that work in us? To testify, in other words. To give an account and say, hey, I'm going to declare who was the one who did it in my life. And it was Jesus Christ. Then, this is also another thing. And when this, I, I finish with this, because this is the last verse of that story, right? And this is, in verse 34, it says, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace, your suffering is over. At the beginning of the story, 
we find this woman, and that's the way that the story introduces her. A woman, a certain woman, no name, no identity. It didn't even tell us, you know, the family, you know, their ans- the, the, her ancestors, at least to kind of relate her to maybe a clan or a family in the town. Nothing. She was just a nobody, no name, certain woman with no identity. But now after meeting Jesus, after being touched by Jesus and Jesus, you know, made this miracle in her. Now she has a new identity. She has now a relationship with her. She has this uh, this new name that Jesus says, daughter. You see how Jesus called her daughter. Now she is in a relationship. She is now a, a, a daughter of the Most High God. Her issues before were her identity. She was known, even though she didn't have any name, she was known as the woman with the issue of blood. That was her name. And maybe you are known by the issue that you're dealing with. And they know you, oh yeah, he's the one that always, you know, or she's the one that, and they know you because of that. But in Jesus Christ, you are not that. You're not your issue. Your identity is not your issue. Your identity is in Jesus Christ. He calls you, you're my son, you're my daughter. And when you had no name, no identity, and nobody, now you are called, you're my daughter, you're my son, you're a child of God. You're a child of God. And then one more thing in that verse. And the band can come up and we're going to close. He said, daughter, new identity, new relationship. He said, go in peace. Your suffering is over. He said, go in peace. It wasn't just a temporary partial relief or healing for that affliction, for that issue. Jesus said, go in shalom, the Hebrew word. Go in shalom. He didn't tell her, okay, I gave you what you needed, but all of the other issues are still going to remain with you. He said, go in shalom. Go in peace. And in the Hebrew meaning of shalom, it's not just peace, the absence of conflict or, you know, friction. Shalom means there's a complete and whole peace that includes everything. Not just peace of mind, but also in your health, in your relationships, emotionally, socially, financially, every area of your life was healed when he told her, go in peace. And that's what Jesus says to us too. I give you my peace. I don't give it to you like the world does. I give you shalom. That means that not just that issue that you and I deal with or certain issues that you and I deal with. Jesus says, I give you healing for all of your issues, all of your life, every area of your life. In your spiritual life, I can bring you peace. In your marriage, I can bring healing. In your family, I can bring healing. In your, with your children, with your son and daughter, I can bring restoration. In your marriage, I can bring restoration. In your finances, I can bring restoration. In everything, because I give you shalom. Something that goes beyond and bigger than your issues. It's a peace and a healing that is complete and it covers every area of your life. Every area of your life. So, why don't you, uh, cl- I want to invite you to close your eyes. And after listening and hearing this story, Jesus is bigger than any issue that you and I may be dealing with. And right now, I want to invite you to just talk to the Lord right there and say, Lord, yes, I have issues, Lord. And sometimes I feel embarrassed to even talk about Him. Or maybe nobody, nobody knows about Him. Maybe just 
one or two people know about it. But it's embarrassing. It's shameful. It, it just makes me feel this shame and guilt. And if it makes me feel like I'm not good enough. Or whatever that issue is for you. Talk to Him and say, Here are my issues. My circumstances. My situations that I'm facing. And yes, there, there may be big issues. But I want to declare that you're bigger than any issue in my life. You're bigger. You're greater. Church, let's sing it together. In Jesus' name, He's greater. He's bigger. He's higher. He's stronger than any issue, any problem, any circumstance, anything that want to come against you. He's bigger. He's greater. We declare this. In Jesus' name. Every issue that I may be facing. Jesus is greater. Jesus is bigger. He's more powerful than any all of them. Than all of those issues. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to ask that we pray uh, this prayer. Maybe there's someone here who says, yes, I know that I have issues. That's, that's something that I know. I don't have to even hide it. I know. And I know I've been dealing with these issues in my life for quite some time or for, you know, just recently. And it doesn't matter if they're big or small issues to you. What matters is that you're here. And I want to make this invitation to you. I want to extend this, this invitation to come and bring your life and your issues to Jesus Christ. You have never, if you have never made a decision to follow Jesus, to trust in Him and to give Him your life and put your faith in Him, today is the day to make that decision. Just to say, Jesus, I want to trust you. I want to put my faith in you. I want to stop doing life my way. I want to do it your way. Teach me how to do that. Teach me how to do that, Lord. If you want to make this decision or if you want to come back to Jesus because you did, you made this decision before, but somehow you just walked away, you stray away, this is the time for you to come back and say, Lord, I want to come back to you. I want to live your way. And it's, if that's you, I want to ask you to say this prayer with me. Say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I come to you to ask you to forgive me forgive me of all of my sins I receive your forgiveness wash me with the blood of Jesus Christ the Lamb of God who takes the sin of the world and takes away my sin I am a new creation by faith I'm a new person today because I give my life to Jesus and I put my faith in you. Teach me to trust you. Teach me to obey you. Teach me to walk with you. And once again, I thank you for making me new, for forgiving me my sins. And I am a new person. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, let's put our hands together and just thank the Lord for... For anybody who made this decision to trust God, 
and to give their life to Jesus today or to even just come back and say hey I want to reconcile my life with God and, and today's the day 